from Brian. Do you listen to any pop music? Uh, only if I have to learn it for a gig, to be honest. Uh, or if I'm listening to something uh, as with my record label owner hat on and trying to see what's happening with all different kinds of music. Uh, but generally, I don't know, I just stick with uh, the music that I like, which is jazz stuff usually. And um, But yeah, so I, I don't know. I mean, it's not that I don't like different kinds of music. It just doesn't enter my awareness of what of what um, I want to listen to. Uh, so what I was listening to most recently, I was checking out this morning, revisiting Slide Hampton's World of Trombones. Obviously, Slide passed uh, last week. It turns out he passed, I think, on the 18th or the 19th, but I, I found out about it on Saturday during the Jazz Trombone Day event. Um, and we were actually playing one of his tunes with the, there's a record called Two Bones, and we played um, Fuss Budget from that. This also has Curtis Fuller on it. And so we, um, we did that, we, we played that, and uh, I was just thinking about Slide and how his great arranging um, skills, not only for big band, but for trombone ensemble. When it comes to musical mastery, there are cerebral components and whimsical components. When it comes to expression, how do you balance the two when you're writing music? The cerebral and the whimsical. I try not to let my music get, uh, I try not to let the music get too technical. You know, Steve Teray, when I used to study with Steve, um, he used to talk about like, <laughs> he would just say, this sounds like a computer, you know, like when something was too like mathematical or too like lacking emotion, you know, or he would say, it's all this and none of this, you know, certain little phrases of his still like ring in my ear about making sure that there's some of this heart, you know, in the music and it's not just uh, all math or all theory or something like that. So I try to write things that I think are slick in that meaning that if you weren't listening for them, you wouldn't know they were happening in terms of like any like musical tricks or anything like that. And make sure that there's some sort of feeling to the music. And so if it gets too mathematical, I just hear Steve Teray in my head saying, that's not music, <laughs> that's math. It sounds like a computer. Um, but I usually, I usually am composing from the stance of like, okay, I, I need a piece that does this or feels like this or has these events in it so that it's like something more than just like fast or slow. It's like this needs to feel like this or this needs to fill this role a sensitive role or an angry role or you know something like that so i try to think about that how to master half tone whole tone scale what is a good way to practice it oh are you talking about the diminished scale best way i found to practice that is to break it into its component parts so that's like and so you need to get both parts of the scale like so good under your slide. So. And then, and then put it all together. But you get that muscle memory. Any scale that you need to be able to play at any moment, like the diminished scale or the half whole scale, you need to practice it till it's so natural that you can't play it wrong. So when I'm trying to practice that kind of thing, that might be while I'm doing something else. Like I'm trying to get the muscle memory while I'm like, I don't know, watching a football game or whatever, you know, getting muscle memory practice in. And I'll literally just sit there and practice shapes or scales or whatever and is until I can't play them wrong. You know, so over and over and over. It's really exciting. Okay, so this is referencing Saturday's Masterclass with Ido Mishulam. He's a great trumpet player out in L.A., if you don't know him. He said, do you agree with Ido when he said you should especially listen to people you don't like so you know what not to sound like? You know, I mean, I think there was a little tongue-in-cheek to that comment. Um, but there's a lot to listening to people or music or reading things by people you don't agree with or like the way they play or like their music. And I think he was being tongue in cheek when he said, like, to learn what not to do. But it also helps you to identify what you want to do. I want to sound like that because X, Y, Z, you know, uh, it's not just what you don't want to do. It's what you want to do as well. So 
I mean, he's, he's right that um, you have to uh, listen to a lot of things. And I think he's just saying that you should challenge what you listen to. Because if you only listen to the same things over and over and over again, then you're not ever getting any new input, any new information, challenging your assumptions. I think that that's kind of like the realm of thought that he was kind of going towards there. But there's a certain truth to it, you know. But it, he means for you, you know. He wants his, him and I are like, a year apart but we play a lot differently we grew up in different places went to different schools it's really interesting i think it's interesting how the things that you select as your biggest influences they really they add up to be di a different product you know what are classic duke ellington albums we should all have in our music collections i think there's like too many of the old ones that are just like individual the word is escaping me but th so they're really short so now it's like a bunch of compilations so there's like the complete Ellington Blanton years, there's the live at Newport, there's, I like all the suites, so that's like the Queen Suite, the New Orleans Suite, the um, Far East Suite, the Nutcracker Suite, if you're into the holiday stuff, um, the Such Sweet Thunder Suite, there's a great record of all Billy Strayhorn things called, and his mother called him Bill, that's a great, a great record. Uh, so like the records are kind of like later in the discography because all that older stuff was maybe a little bit more like just a couple tracks at a time rather than albums that we think of now. From Connor, he says, in your opinion, what are Slide's top five albums? So we're talking about Slide Hampton passing uh, last week. Um, I don't know about top five albums, but I'll, I'll mention a few albums of his that I really like. Do I have it? There's one, there's this Japanese import where he's playing... Uh, the pictures of him in Riverside Park in New York, but it's all Japanese. It's all in Japanese. I like that one. It's got Last Minute Blues, also known as Chop Suey, on it, and it's with a European rhythm section. There's Mellow D, which is a great live recording. There's, um, of course, Day in Copenhagen with Dexter Gordon is one of his best outings, I think. He's got one called Explosion. I like a record of his called Exodus. Um, and of course the two World of Trombones records, the first one is just called World of Trombones and then the second one is called, I think it's also called World of Trombone. But one has got Slide on the cover, that's the older one, and the other one has Bill Watrous on it and it's got like a red and green and black cover. Um, so there's those two. And then um, of course all this great big band writing. So I don't know about top five, but, but there's a bunch of Slide that I would send you to. Do you believe that every set list you make for a performance has a secret storyline to your music? Titles in an order sounds to me like you're crafting a storyline. Story um, I don't know if I do that necessarily. I think um, with a set list for a live gig, it's different than on a record. I think about telling a story more with a record because you have more time for that to play out. In a live show, you're also telling a story, but I think it's a different story that you're telling. But, I mean... That's not necessarily the case. I mean, when I play with Anat Cohen, we tend to play the music almost in a similar order to the records to tell that story again. So it's not that you can't do it, but I wouldn't say that the titles necessarily reflect the story always. I think when you are programming a live set, there's like the quote unquote like normal way to do it where you're gonna, like the collegiate way or the academic way which is like, oh, fast tune, medium tune, ballad, you know, straight eighth, something, whatever, you know, um, which is pretty formulaic and I don't find it to be super useful when, when I'm planning a set because I don't write my music that way necessarily. So I've been thinking a lot more about like, how does the song engage the audience or challenge the audience? Are they ready to be engaged or challenged do they need a break? Like, how does the programming of the of musical events, really? So I find that, like, grabbing their attention is important at the beginning, but not beating them over the head in such a way that it turns them off, you know? And then I think, like, playing something that's familiar. So, like, recently, like, I try to put, for example, Maria, the tune I play from West Side Story. I play, I put that into like the first three songs usually, and then maybe a ballad, or maybe I put Maria second, and then I do a ballad, maybe an Ellington thing, 
um, to draw people in in a way where it's like, oh, this guy's going to play music I know or that I'm familiar with. And then I go can take them on the journey through my music as well after connecting them. But that's not for everybody. That's just like I have such a strong passion for that Ellington and connecting to the tradition and the trombone tradition and bebop and JJ and whatever. That it's like I want to take them on that journey, you know. So I do. I try to. And then I find when I drift away from that and focus more on originals, I can feel the audience sometimes drifting, you know. So I try to, I'm trying to find a way to be able to do both, you know. What's your opinion on having a good sound versus having a good personal sound? Obviously, certain things have different requirements as far as that goes, but I'd be interested to know what you think about the idea of that at least. Yeah, I think that uh, a good sound is a good sound, and you have to have a good sound, period, end of story. I think that that means a lot of things, you know. I think that there's like certain characteristics like let's just say slide and curtis right because i'm talking about those two versus slide curtis and jj all different sounds all good sounds in different ways right like slide could tend to be a little more aggressive with this sound jj obviously super refined super clear and then curtis was a little bit more fuzzy or a little bit more warm a little bit more like a hug i like to think about it it feels like this you know um, so the important things to me in a good sound, there are characteristics of a good sound, which is that it has a lot of resonance. And so having resonance can have a lot of different sonic qualities, but that core is still there. The core of the resonance is still there no matter what. So um, you got to have a good sound, 100%. But that, what that means, having a good sound, this is something we talk about within the first couple weeks of students coming to UNT and taking my class, my fundamentals class. The, what is a good sound? What makes a good sound? I do, a, I do workshops about this when I go out to schools. What is a good sound? Why is that the case? How do we make a good sound? And then what makes them personal? You know, we, and I'd like to say like Alessi, Wycliffe Gordon, Curtis Fuller, all great sounds. They don't sound anything alike really, other than they play trombone, so. Yes, play with a good sound, please, Ben. What is your approach to teaching slash introducing jazz music to people who have had little exposure to it? My community is struggling immensely, and I'm trying to teach this music as much as possible. So there's something that Joe Lovano said in a master class while I was at Juilliard, and I try to take that to heart in that jazz is not a what, but a how. And so what does that mean to me? So when, I, when you think about it as a how, it's a spirit of improvisation it's a spirit of bringing your own vibe to a piece of music it's the spirit of exploration it's the spirit of swing in a certain in many cases not all cases uh, it's a search it's like a self-reflective search uh, and creative process all of those things so to me any song can be turned into can be approached with that aesthetic or with that idea or with that approach so what i would do is try to connect people with something that they know but that is a that is presented with a jazz aesthetic or with that spirit that spirit of the how i'm going to use it to explore creativity to explore expression um, so for a while when i was in college that meant having like a funk and fusion band and we would play that kind of stuff now I don't, I'm not doing that so much. I'm doing more whatever, straight ahead, something. But finding a way to connect with people is important. I, I play, I record all original music most of the time. But when I go to play gigs, I play tunes, you know. I don't only play my music because I'm trying to bring people on a journey, like Taylor was asking about. I'm trying to get people onto my team so that I can show them my original music and they don't just run away, you know. They're not overwhelmed by it. So, you know, other things to do is to keep the solo short. Don't, don't improvise forever and ever. People's attention spans are pretty short. And I think there's a certain amount of it where it just needs to be in the air. And what does that mean? I mean, like, you need to hear it kind of in the background. You need to hear jazz. You know, you need to hear swing. You need to hear acoustic music. Something that I notice recently is that even on like Spotify's State of Jazz playlist, which is like one of the biggest playlists for jazz music, most of it is not acoustic music. Most of it is a lot of electronics, uh, process, sound processing, 
uh, effects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is cool. I think it's cool, but like that makes an acoustic record sound super weird. <laughs> you know, like it sounds super out of place. So um, using anything you can to make, so make it sonically more relatable can be important. Uh, so that might mean incorporating keyboards or synthesizers or electric bass you know so anyway hopefully that helps arthur what is your current upper register limit that you feel comfortable to play comfortable to play like right off the bat like i'm gonna pick up my horn and play it for you right now or use in a song or use in an improvisation i don't know i would say a high f i play a f sharp sometimes in this uh, single pedal of a rose arrangement that i do but i would say that's probably the highest note that i would expect myself to be able to play regularly like a high f sharp i'd like to hear your thoughts on this quote by stephen pressfield the sign of the amateur is over glorification of and preoccupation with the mystery the professionals shut up she doesn't talk about it she does her work thoughts yes <laughs> yes that's 100 percent what it is i talk about it in like i talk about it as like being obsessed and like being obsessed with the process be obsessed with making small achievements um, day to day uh, rather than yeah I mean that's a good way of saying like you know you're you're you get obsessed with the results you get obsessed with the I need this gig I need this uh, affirmation I need this um, but no it's just like you just commit yourself to the process you show up every day and eventually you get to the goal it could take a year it could take 10 years uh, but yeah, I agree with the quote. I mean, I agree with the quote and that that's why amateurs are obsessed with gear. You know, like you're obsessed because you think that that is a thing that's like, oh, the, prof the professionals have the right gear so they can do it. That's sorry. That's one manifestation of that kind of idea. It's not only that, but I especially see it like in, you know, recording or like in pop music or like guys that buy a bunch of buy a bunch of gear because they think it's going to like make them more professional. Right. It has nothing to do with that. Being a professional means that, and I see he says there's a difference between being an amateur and a professional. Yeah, of course there's a difference. Uh, you know, the simple de definition is like being a professional means you're going to show up and take care of business, uh, whatever it might be that gets thrown at you, you know, and, and all that sort of thing. He says the professional doesn't take success or failure personally. Yeah, they, the professional shows up and does the job that's asked of them, you know, they're, what they were hired for, their skill set. And yeah, like it, this is me. This is what I have to offer, you know. And then you take it or leave it. What's the most challenging piece that you wrote when you were in session? The hardest tune that I've written is probably called "The Chase," and it's off the record. "The Chase." Uh, the the lines I wrote were kind of awkward. It changes time signature. Probably that one. That one's pretty hard. And I guess it's hard on saxophone too. So says Lucas Pino. Have you ever met someone you greatly disliked until you heard them play? <laughs> Um, what can I say about this? I disconnect someone's playing from their personality. So there's plenty of people that pr play great that I would not want to hang out with. Um, the playing and the personality are not the same. There's plenty of people I'd rather hang out with that don't play maybe at, quote unquote as good, you know. No one's playing has ever made me like them. I can say that. Uh, I've never heard anyone that plays so good that I'm like, oh, I'm going to like that person now or I'm going to hire that person now only because they play really well. Like, I don't want to deal. I don't want to deal with that. I got to think of an album concept for your honors year at jazz school and then spend the year writing charts for that album. What is the process like for you when thinking of an album concept? Yeah. Um, so when I'm thinking of an album concept, well, first of all, I don't settle on just one concept at first. I try to think of a lot of concepts, and then I try to think about them all from different angles. You know, like there's not just one angle to a project. Um, different types of projects will connect connect to different type of people. Meaning, like if you are trying to reach a specific demographic, so I kind of break it up into like. I can even use my own projects as an example. So like the last record, Cast of Characters from 2019 or 2020, was for me. It was music I wrote because I wanted to write it and I wanted it to be focused on a concept 
and focused on the music. It was music for music's sake, more or less. So when I thought about that, I brainstormed about a lot of different possible concepts. And I was like, oh, I think I want to do this. I want to focus on this, like talking about archetypes of people that come through people's life. And then from there, I even brainstormed lots and lots of different possible people or possible archetypes or possible ways of expressing that. Um, so I did that. But um, that is in stark contrast to, for example, um, an album, We the Pe uh, Here and Now from 2017, you know, 2017, 2018, I forget when it came out, but um, that, that one was more about being in the present moment and that music was written, you know, in 2016 during all the political chaos and that, I think it reflects that. and. Um, and then the record, I, so 2018, uh, No Arrival came out. And that one was all tunes, mostly all tunes, because that one was geared towards, I want to really connect with, you know, the radio part of the jazz industry and, and create songs that are a little shorter and more radio friendly um, and stuff like that. So you can kind of target different parts of the 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 industry and then, you know if it's your first record like maybe that means you want to display all the different things you can do or maybe it means you want to come out with a strong conceptual statement because that's how people are going to get to know you and your music and it's important to remember no matter what you're come up coming up with for your concept of that record is that it's got to be multiple records and multiple concepts and so the more concepts you can think about and the more ways you can connect with the audience over time is going to be beneficial to growing your career. So um, so I think about that, and then once I've got the concept, then I start to think about what the different emotions or feelings are that need to go into it, or what, maybe there's components of that concept that need to be expressed in music. So I try not to define it in the, by a number, or it needs to be this many, but you know, generally an album needs like 40 minutes worth of music. So you can split that up however you want, you know? It needs to have contrast. It needs to take them on a journey. Or it can just be a collection of songs that are just randomly thrown together. And it expresses whatever you're thinking about in that moment. And I think both of those are valid. And I think they're both certainly valid. And um, there's a lot of ways you can come up with a concept. And sometimes you go with a marketing approach first. Like there's a timely event and you want to do a tribute. Or, you know, being like there are a lot of people making more politically oriented albums, you know, from 17, 18, 19. And now people are making more like pandemic related albums. And like, there's all these kind of things that have to do with whatever's happening, happening now. So, all right, here's another question. In jazz education, we are always taught that melodicism and minimalistic ideas will make a great use of storytelling in improvisation and composition. How do you practice minimalism when you're trying to get your narrative across? Well, I think of it like this, like one of my arranging teachers always taught, taught us that Andy Farber, great arranger in New York, he writes a lot of just kind of straight ahead big band music and is amazing at this, but he also does film scores and all kinds of other things. And he talks about, and I took this 100% away from working with him, was that like anything that you introduce in a piece or in an improvisation is like a character. So, and if you get too many characters in your story too fast, regardless of style, if there's too many characters, it becomes unclear. Like if you like if you think about a movie or a book, if there's too many characters thrown in all at once at the beginning, you don't relate to any of them. You don't get the story or the meaning behind what they're talking about. So I try to limit the amount of characters that I introduce into a piece or a song. So sometimes it's like, oh yeah, I wanna stack all these things. And it's like, well, now there's five characters in, the, in 16 bars of music, we can't absorb that many characters that fast uh, as a listener and appreciator of the music. So I try to um, think about it that way. So limit the amount of characters that get introduced at a given time, you know? And so that might mean different things in different musical situations, but I think that plays into the idea of minimalism because you're trying to make the most out of the least amount of information. And I think doing that compositionally is something that really helps your improvising. There's this, you're, 
musical personality is both of those things together. So if you're not developing your compositional side as well as your improvisational side, you're kind of missing out. Because composing in the jazz area, any area, is like, because because we focus so much on improvisation and in the moment, that's just like out of the moment. You know what I'm saying? Like it's not in time. It's not in time creativity. It's out of time creativity. And you're developing, what do I actually hear? You know, when I hear these two notes, where do they want to go? And that's what I think about. It's, it's the counterpoint between the two notes. And where does my ear want to hear this counterpoint going? Is it together? Is it separate? Is it the converging? You know, all of those things. And I wouldn't get there if I didn't practice composition. And then when I'm blowing or improvising, that those choices start to those choices start to manifest themselves. Certain uh, so it could start as simple as a tritone substitution, or starting to hear the sharp eleven on a major chord. Very simple ideas that we teach in jazz education. But if you don't actively engage with those ideas, they're never going to come out quite right in your playing. You know, so. Um, so I guess that's how they're related, and that's how it's related to minimalism, I guess. What do you think about and listen for when you're rehearsing a jazz band? So, I mean, I think it depends what level they're at, but um, the most general answer that I can give you, especially if we're talking about, you know, a younger band, even a college band, it doesn't matter. I know this is gonna sound overly simplified and like generic, but do they know what jazz sounds like? Um, do they know how it's supposed to feel? How can I help them discover what it's supposed to feel like? That's my job, I feel like, in a clinic or something when I'm coming in and like I have only one thing to impart upon them. Um, what do the eighth notes feel like? What do the accents feel like? And get them turned on to that because if they have that information, they can take it and run with it, you know? Um, the accuracy of notes and rhythms and pitches and blah 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 are you crescendoing and cutting off together all of that to me is secondary to the execution of the feeling of the music and if, because if it's not there there's no way it's ever going to swing and if you're if, if you have no concept if you think boo do 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 describes what jazz sounds like you would be one incorrect and two you're never going to get anywhere so that's kind of like a starting point for me when I'm listening to and rehearsing a jazz band. It's like, do they know what jazz sounds like? Okay, cool. Second is, do they have a sound as an ensemble? Does it sound like an ensemble or does it sound like a bunch of sounds happening simultaneously? It needs to be cohesive. So how do we get them to be cohesive? They need to blend and ultimately balance, you know? It's not in balance, it's mostly out of balance. And when it's out of balance, then it's mostly out of tune. So it's like all of these like concepts, they add up, you know? So if you come into a band and it sounds super out of tune, you know, a lot of the time it's really closer to in tune than maybe we want to think. Maybe it's out of tune, but like, especially if it's a, you know, college band or something and they have some sense of pitch, it's mostly out of, out of balance because you know, we don't spend enough time with like more dissonant chords and tuning them, mostly because we don't have time, you know. But that's why I put out that giant drone course that I've been talking about for months. It's like you have to go through every key, every note, and hear the tendency of that note on your instrument against every other note. There's 12 notes, so there's 11 notes, versus, there's 12 notes versus 12 bass notes. Right, you gotta practice them all. And it, they're different above the octave. So it's like, yes, there's one octave, but then when you do it in tenths, elevenths, thirteenths, fourteenths, fifteenths, it sounds different. It's a different tuning experience. So we always do, I always have my students practice two octaves from the root note, so you can get all the, those extensions and tune them. Um, and that's one, that's one way of doing uh, expressing that intonation. And then the second way is like, balancing it in a chord voicing. So feeling, blend, balance, sound, um, those are the most important things. You can fix rhythms and notes. Anybody can do that, you know. But how do you impart that into a group of students? I mean, you might be listening together, playing examples at them, getting them to sing, getting them to move. I often have the students get up out of the chairs, move around, and get that dance into the music. Um, 
And you got to pick the right you got to pick the right charts too. You got to make sure that the music is real music and it's not dumbed down um, high school charts or whatever. It should be real stuff, man. And like that's that's a problem that I see is that we they get out of the habit of playing easy charts that are good real music and they get these kind of like nonsense charts uh, which makes it hard to sound good because the music doesn't sound it's not written well okay he says returning to a, something i asked a while back with a tune like life happens it has a simple melody and a simple progression when writing simple tunes does that help you see from your perspective that simplicity means more than a melody that sounds too talkative yeah, I don't think a melody that has too many notes is very memorable. Uh, sometimes I kind of think of different tunes like some tunes or some vibes like I'm thinking of the vibe and the emotion of the tune like some of that needs perpetual motion like it needs a lot of action. And so that will have a lot of notes in the melody. Right. Or if you've established that it's going to have kind of like a bebop tune feel, it needs to have a lot of notes, not a lot of notes, but it needs to have lines. It needs to be have activity. Um, with that particular tune, Life Happens, it was the beginning of me exploring inversions, chord inversions. Um, and so I was writing a sequence of chord inversions, and that's what that vamp is on that tune. But the, the simple melody and complex harmony thing, more complex harmony, is something that goes back to the idea of simplicity. And when I said, I try to make things slick that like you wouldn't notice unless you were really listening to it. So it's a simple chord progression that's repeating, but like if you look look more deeply into it, you might be discover that there's more there. You know, there are, there's multiple layers to it. But you know who did that was Wayne Shorter. Wayne is like the master of writing something simple melodically and complex harmon harmonically. So it satisfies both sides of the equation. That's what I aspire to write like. If I could write anything that was as memorable as Wayne Shorter, I would be so glad. And I'm not trying to compare myself to him. I'm just saying that like that's the level where it's like, okay, there's this crazy, like interesting harmonic mixture, modal mixture, super beautiful melodies. And he does both at the same time. It's interesting from the musician's point of view. It's interesting from the listener's point of view. It's relatable, all of those things. A bassist and this weekend I jammed some duo with a trombonist, nice. The question of register popped into my mind. That's something I don't usually feel the need to consider playing with a trumpet. Any thoughts, e.g., how much I should get out of your way? Oh, from a bassist point of view, um, that's a good question. I think the trombonist has equal uh, buy-in to that idea. They need to stay out of your way too and realize that you know they need to maybe play more in the upper register to stay out of your range. Yeah, I mean, it's a question of awareness. You know, I don't mind to play in the same register as the bassist. I just, you know, you just have to know that that's happening. Um, I, so to me, if you're playing with me, Charles, you don't need to get out of my way. I'll get out of your way. You know, I think I always suggest to my students that you got to listen more to everyone else than to yourself. So when you're listening to everyone else more, you'll notice what register they're in. If you're going up, maybe I'll go down, you know all these sort of different things, you know? So I think it's both of your jobs. And so I had a duo gig for a long time with a bass player. We played at a restaurant. And so I would do different things to try to stay out of his way. A cup mute or different mutes and all these kind of things to try to have different sonic, um, different sonic options help stay out of the way because that changes the tone a little bit. But it's not just the bass player's job. The trombonist also needs to know what register they're playing in. And it can be muddy with the bass, but yeah, we always joked that it was the bass clef duo. Uh, but it was, I always like playing with bass, man. That's a real good, a really nice uh, combination with trombone, I think. Just bass and trombone. Uh, what helps you to keep a positive mindset when things aren't going well for you? I don't know that I always do. <laughs> I'll just, you know, just being honest. I try to be positive, but I'm not all the time. <clears throat> I might outwardly be positive, but... You know, things suck sometimes. Um, and it's just kind of being okay with it. I'm working on more and more, like being able to let go of things, you know, let go of expectations, let go of trying to control 
too many things that aren't really in my control, things that I thought were in my control that actually aren't in my control, um, stuff like that. But ultimately, you can't like not continue to move forward. You know, ultimately, this is kind of my mindset about it. It's like, no matter how good or bad it is, in that moment, it's gonna pass. And you have to keep moving forward. And if you don't keep moving forward, uh, then like, what are you gonna do? Like, you're not gonna reach your goals, you're not gonna get done what you're trying to get done, like personally or professionally or whatever. So if I, you're in a bad spot, especially if, especially if you're in a bad spot, like you gotta keep moving because you're, to get out of that bad spot is not gonna happen without a lot of effort, you know? Uh, whether it's a personal issue, whether it's a professional issue, whether it's playing, music, trombone, career, whatever, like you have to, keep moving like don't stop just keep working keep moving you know because if you wait opportunities will pass you by they just will you know so just keep moving man you're a good trombone player elvis what was the most philosophical lesson you had when you were a student that helped you improve something that you were not super good at the most important philosophical lesson that i learned as a student was probably that Everything that you think it is, is not, is not. What do I mean? I mean like every time you think, you don't really know what something is like. Like every time you think like that person has achieved X because they did Y. If you do Y, it does not equal X. <laughs> you know, like it doesn't, it doesn't like mean anything. A lot of these like arbitrary things we make up. And what I just mean like, oh, I thought, for example, I'll give you just the real example. like. I thought, oh, let me go to Juilliard and like, I'll be set up for life. Like, I'll be have a check mark of like, yeah, you're great. And then you go off into the world and you know what, it doesn't mean anything. You're still, yeah, I mean, it's a good thing for your resume and whatever. And some people will think it's cool that you went there, but like ultimately it doesn't mean anything in terms of your artistry, in terms of your career. Like you still have to go out there and like work, <laughs> you know? You still gotta get it together and you still have to, move forward like we've been talking about um so that that realization that things aren't really what they seem you know is important was is and was it still is um and it's like like he said juilliard's still your dream yeah sure it's not i'm just saying like that thing is not gonna equal anything more than just that experience there's plenty of people that don't get in, that have great careers there. And I'm just using it as one example that I thought, I honestly thought that it was going to be go to this school, man, and it's like, this is the answer. Um, so there's no simple answer. And it's like, and even you think about getting a great gig, you go and play the gig, it's like, it's not that much different than an okay gig in terms of all the, all the whole thing. Like the music is better. And it's great music, but like everything else is kind of the same. So it's got, it's like just weird. It's just a weird thing that it's like, oh, it's, uh, it's not what it seems. Like this great gig is like, it's great, but then like, oh, well, you can't be a full-time musician playing only in like one person's big band, for example, unless it's the Jazz and Lincoln Center Orchestra or a military band. But if it's like somebody's big band, like I always wanted to play in Maria Schneider's band. This is a good example. And like, that band is great, but it's not a full-time job. Like it's not enough gigs. So it was like, anytime you would like, I would realize these things that I had made up in my mind that like, oh, if I get into this group, then that means X, Y, Z. And it's not really the case, you know? I don't know. So anyway, this is an ongoing <laughs> philosophical battle within my own mind here. All right, thank you. Wow, so many great questions today. Appreciate everybody coming by. Um, we'll be back. I'll be back next week on Tuesday for another round of Q&A. So thanks for tuning in. I'm going to get on to the next thing, and uh, we'll see you real soon.